Jerome, thank you, you all um, for, for coming. Uh, this is the second uh, uh, assembly meeting uh, uh, of uh, this Art for UBI uh, manifesto. Uh, basically, a lot of us uh, uh, for many years uh, are uh, in a way uh, um, discussing uh, and uh, fighting uh, and uh, thinking about uh, uh, this uh, um, this need of uh, a universal and unconditioned basic income uh, um, uh, uh, we, I mean a different way uh, to to be sustainable uh, and uh, to distribute uh, wealth uh, in our society um, the last uh, the last year uh, in uh, actually in a I have to say in a first uh, meeting uh, uh, in this um, Italian uh, um, forum for contemporary art uh, with uh, Institute of Radical Imag Imagination, uh, uh, we started again to discuss how uh, the art sector, we uh, as artists uh, or um, operators uh, in, the art, in, in the art sector, uh, uh, we could relaunch uh, a front uh, uh, demanding uh, uh, and discussing uh, uh, what it is uh, a universal and unconditional basic income and then uh, uh, we had this first meeting uh, in Institute of Radical Imagination uh, uh, School of Mutation uh, Iteration uh, um, discussing uh, how to launch uh, a sort of uh, manifesto very uh, 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 clear and uh, uh, stating uh, basically that uh, we as artists uh, uh, demand uh, a universal basic income, not simply for ourselves uh, as a, a, a part of this society, maybe with uh, some privilege, but really uh, having a vision uh, for the world society. We as artists, uh, uh, would like uh, to change uh, the set of this distribution of wealth in the society. And we feel that the, so the society is needing it. Uh, in uh, which forms? Um, uh, we don't know uh, exactly because uh, the forms uh, are many. Uh, that's uh, an issue about government, but there is also the possibility to create forms of distribution of wealth uh, in the uh, UBI mode. Also, let's say, self-organizing or uh, um, creating a way um, bottom-up uh, to distribute wealth in this, in this way. Um, for sure, in this manifesto, uh, we agree, there is a general agreement uh, that the UBI uh, means uh, uh, to free up time and so to free up uh, uh, ourselves from the blackmail uh, of precarious jobs. Uh, this is a general statement that is very heavy. And um, on the other side, we said uh, also in the last meeting uh, that uh, UBI means uh, the possibility to say no, no to what? Basically to this capitalistic uh, mode of production uh, because um, it free up uh, all the possibility to recognize uh, all the invisible reproductive labor that we already are doing uh, in our society. Um, and this is also connected to the possibility to imagine uh, uh, um, a world uh, based on uh, climate justice. That is another pillar uh, of, uh, um, of the challenge we have uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this contemporary um, uh, time. Um, so, uh, um, 
as I said before, uh, for sure, this manifesto is pointing uh, uh, the government. Uh, and so we know that in order to have the possibility to reframe uh, the welfare system based on uh, a UBI, we have also to criticize uh, the actual form of uh, uh, taxation and uh, money creation and our relationship with debt, uh, how governments are creating uh, uh, this chain of uh, blackmail uh, of liquidity. Uh, and so we also discussed uh, um, the role uh, that are growing up, uh, especially under the pandemic, um, uh, by uh, the uh, digital platform, for example, that are substituting uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure and uh, uh, services. Uh, uh, but basically, uh, especially in our in our countries, uh, are not contributing to the state welfare. Um, and uh, finally, uh, a lot of uh, uh, contributors uh, in uh, this discussion uh, took example uh, again of self-organized UBI systems uh, with. Uh, uh, alternative currency and new technology or creating uh, alliances uh, in between uh, uh, some uh, uh, local institution uh, or uh, uh, simply uh, community-based uh, collectivizing uh, their income, their resources uh, and deciding uh, to distribute uh, this common wallet, uh, this common pot uh, uh, in a different way. Uh, and so uh, uh, creating a really pilot of uh, uh, unconditioned basic income uh, self-managed. Uh, so I think uh, this is the picture that uh, uh, we scanned <laughs> through uh, this, this iteration uh, with uh, Art for UBI manifesto. And uh, as um, we, were t uh, we were speaking uh, before, um, Probably the next week, let's say, uh, we are going to, 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 to make it public. Um, now, uh, a lot of um, uh, participants to these meetings uh, are in the back end discussing uh, the final uh, version of uh, the Art for UBI manifesto. And so these are the really last days of uh, this editing process. Uh, and um, and the next week uh, or uh, in few days uh, we want to make it up. And so also is um, uh, an invitation uh, to you all uh, to to have a look uh, and to spread uh, uh, the word. Um, so I would like maybe to uh, to leave to Marco uh, introduce uh, uh, the first speakers of today, and uh, I hope. Uh, uh, with uh, this uh, meeting uh, to to enrich um, uh, this picture. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. So I'm glad to introduce uh, a friend and a comrade, Ilenia, <coughs> Ilenia Kaleo. Ilenia is an activist, a performer, and a, and a, a researcher. She works now uh, at the MA, she teaches at the MA, in studies and gender politics at the University of Roma 3 in Rome and also at the U of University of, uh, of Venice. Um, why is she here? She's here because uh, she has been working massively on issues such as art labor, cultural labor, um, especially from a feminist and queer perspective. She has been one of the key figures in the uh, occupation of the Teatro Valle in Rome, basically the occupation that uh, I think now almost 10 years ago, uh, basically um, initiated a, a, a movement of cultural workers in, uh, in an important movement of cultural workers in Italy. And last but not least, she's among the organizers of, of a um, of a group, of an activist group that is called Il Campo Innocente, the Innocent Field, is a group basically uh, um, uh, uniting uh, performing artists, mostly uh, performing artists, and we think 
it is a very, very interesting example of a mobilization platform during this pandemic and against basically the, 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 the crisis of, of uh, arts and cultural labor that is tied to the crisis, to the pandemic, to the present pandemic. So thank you, Ilenia. I'll leave the word to you. Again, Ilenia will speak Italian and Gabriella will translate. The other speakers will afterwards speak directly in English. So grazie, Ilenia, per essere con noi. Grazie, Marco. Hi to everyone. I will speak in Italian. Thanks to Gabriella for translating. Uh, allora, sì, mh, qualche spunto forse può essere interessante in questo contesto, visto che arriviamo da luoghi diversi e da pratiche diverse, portare qualche spunto appunto dalla situazione italiana. Eh, in cui eh, c'è una mancanza strutturale de, di riconoscimento del lavoro artistico, proprio un mancato riconoscimento del lavoro artistico come forma, eh, come forma di lavoro. E eh, anche per questo motivo e a partire da questo vuoto, eh, le lotte che si sono sviluppate, Marco lo accennava prima, mh, parlo dell'ultimo ciclo a partire dal 2010, eh, hanno messo a fuoco questo elemento e provato anche a tentare delle pratiche di risposta. Yeah, so some ideas to put at the center of this discussion coming because we are all coming from different practices, uh, but bringing the Italian situation as an example, um, what is lacking is the Italian situation is, is lacking of a real structural recognition of artwork as such. So since 2010, um, struggles have moved really towards uh, addressing this issue. E appunto lotte che eh, si sono sviluppate anche in un contesto di crisi eh, economica, l'ultima che abbiamo avuto prima di questa che sta arrivando e eh, possiamo leggere, no? eh, Marco lo accennava, l'occupazione di spazi, spazi appunto il Valle Occupato è stato uno di questi, ma molti eh, hanno poi no, continuato negli anni, Macao, il Saldox, l'asilo una rete, no? e vedere questa occupazione di spazi come una forma di auto-organizzazione del lavoro culturale da un lato, ma anche come un tentativo di sperimentare delle forme di distribuzione, di mutualismo e anche delle nuove economie informali. E yeah, so the struggles rose in a, during a period of economic uh, crisis namely the period of 2020 and afterwards, and it's the period where in Italy we have uh, many occupations and a real movement starting from Valle, going to Macau in uh, Milan, Saledoc in Venice, or Lazilo in Napoli. And all of those spaces, all these um, uh, re responses to the situation of the crisis from the part of uh, cultural workers, Uh, was the response done and provided with self-organization and experimenting new economies, new practices based on mutualism. Ecco, un po' in linea con questa genealogia di lotte e di pratiche e eh, essendo state dentro invece tre anni di pieno politico che eh, in Italia ha portato il movimento eh, femminista, transfemminista, non una di meno, eh, questo collettivo di cui faccio parte in maniera informale insieme ad altro artista e eh, lavorato del, dello spettacolo che appunto si chiama Il Campo Innocente ha eh, messo a fuoco, stiamo provando a mettere a fuoco alcuni punti che forse può essere interessante condividere. Ecco il primo un po' come eh, richiama anche il nome il fatto che eh, pur in questa mancanza di riconoscimento e di diritti eh, provare a non eh, dichiarare, ecco provare a dire che l'arte non è un terreno separato, non è uno spazio privilegiato perché eh, c'è molta precarietà e c'è molta violenza. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, in this genealogy of the struggles and the practices, uh, I'm also part of this uh, political movement everywhere, seeing 
um, largest flood that is mm, non una menos. Uh, and um, the collective of performers I'm part of named Campo Innocente, the innocent field, is really uh, focusing, being a collective of performers and art workers is uh, focusing on some points. And one point is that despite the lack of recognition of rights, of, to, of the rights of the uh, cultural and art workers, art is not a privileged field in any way. It is a field where there is a lot of precarity and violence. So in no way uh, the artistic field um, escapes from um, common conditions. E questo è un punto importante proprio perché per questa mancanza in Italia di riconoscimento che spinge parte eh, dei lavoratori del settore e del settore a chiedere uno statuto separato di riconoscimento. E, e anche significa però dire, specialmente in questo momento di pandemia, che le lotte corporative non hanno per noi alcuna prospettiva, alcun respiro in particolare No, in questo momento pandemico in cui ne abbiamo già parlato altre volte, eh, se c'è una cosa che eh, il virus ci sta insegnando è che i, i corpi sono interdipendenti, che i nostri corpi sono connessi in una maniera molto profonda e immediata anche. This lack of recognition that we have, starting from this point, uh, is moving towards the um, requiring the, the uh, claiming for a statute, but we do not believe in any way that corporate struggles uh, belonging to one section have any future, uh, and even more so because during the pandemic we've learned how fundamentally our, our bodies are interconnected. Um, and interdependent. Sorry, I missed the other term. Um, perso l'ultimo, l'ultimo meraviglioso. No. Yeah, okay. Um, no, e quindi ecco un elemento è, che è stato anche un tentativo di mettere a fuoco una pratica che abbiamo eh, condiviso in questi mesi all'interno del, del gruppo del campo innocente è stata una domanda come fare a dire no come possiamo dire no quali sono le condizioni che ci consentono di poter dire no e anche come poter dire dei no gioiosi dei no che non diventano eh, autolesionisti e, eh, e questo elemento della possibilità di dire no e eh, del rifiuto è per noi ovviamente connesso alla questione del ricatto lavorativo ma anche relazionale e della possibilità eh, di una autonomia e del fatto che proprio come donne, come persone queer, trans, non binarie, come soggetti ehm, appunto eh, sessualmente e identitariamente esterni all'identità all eh, dominante, questa violenza e queste forme di ricatto si esercitano anche nel settore artistico e anche eh, con maggior violenza. Um, so as Campo Innocente, uh, we focus on one basic question. This was our practice. And the question is, how can we say no? How can we say no? And which are the conditions that allow us to say no, being constantly under the blackmail of the conditions, the consequence of uh, our working conditions, which are absolutely non uh, protected. So what allows us to say no, even a no which could be said in a joyous way, in a non-autolesionist way. We all come as uh, women, queer, trans, non-binary um, bodies and uh, so we, um, we inhabit uh, subjectivities that are totally external to the dominant uh, identity. Ecco, mi sembra molto importante riuscire a mettere a fuoco questo punto. 
eh, che la violenza, la violenza sui corpi e su certi soggetti si esercita anche nella forma della violenza economica e della precarietà e che questi due elementi non sono scollegati e che ci sono quindi dei soggetti, siamo dei soggetti in alcuni casi più esposti e più vulnerabili e eh, che una, una strategia per rispondere anche alla violenza maschile la violenza patriarcale no? è fare in modo di non essere eh, messe in condizioni di ricatto dentro gli spazi e le situazioni lavorative. Ecco, in questo, in questo senso il reddito è anche eh, in maniera molto forte una eh, risposta alla violenza che si esercita sui corpi. In una prospettiva um... stabilista. So in this transfeminist perspective, we see how we are bodies and our bodies are subject of violence. And the violence is also an economic violence uh, due to the lack of uh, recognition of the rights. So um, as economic subjects, we acknowledge that we ourselves in a position of vulnerability, stronger vulnerability. Most of the time, the violence of uh, patriarchal um, society um, is putting us in, in a frame. Uh, so the income, universal income, is seen as a possible answer to come out of those frames. Eh, L'ultimo passaggio è proprio ancora no? una, una prospettiva eh, in prospettiva transfemminista. Il, il femminismo ci ha storicamente mostrato eh, il nesso, la, la relazione tra eh, la, la svalutazione del lavoro di cura e in questo senso molto del lavoro artistico è vicino al lavoro riproduttivo quindi un lavoro che però è stato naturalizzato che è stato costruito come un lavoro a disposizione già eh, disponibile e la svalutazione delle risorse e, e dell'ambiente della natura no? come fossero risorse disponibili gratuitamente ecco questa messa a disposizione di risorse dei nostri corpi dell'ambiente eh, come fossero uh, gratuite è, è il risultato no? di, una, di un modello espropriativo, di un modello estrattivo, che è proprio per queste stesse, questa, questa correlazione diciamo è costituente, questo modello estrattivo è un modello che è al tempo stesso è proprio in relazione, in virtù di questa relazione, un modello insieme coloniale e patriarcale. Per questo no? non è possibile un femminismo che non sia anche anticoloniale e un antirozzismo che non sia anche antipatriarcale. Mi sembra che tenere insieme questo elemento nel ripensare le forme del lavoro e la richiesta del reddito sia eh, assolutamente determinante no? rispetto alle lotte che sono attive eh, in questo momento. E, um... Niente, poi solo un ultimo passaggio, ecco che magari su questo poi torniamo anche successivamente, no? di riuscire eh, a partire dal manifesto che lanceremo anche a mettere a fuoco delle pratiche eh, che magari sono attive in questo momento pandemico, che magari possono anche essere delle soluzioni locali o dei prototipi legati al, al lavoro artistico, ma che ci sono interessanti perché possono essere riprodotte e, e diventare anche degli esperimenti più larghi relativi al, uh, appunto a pratiche di uh, reddito incondizionato. Ok, so one last passage is in the transfeminist perspective, feminism um, has highlighted uh, how it is evident the de-evaluation of the work of care. And under this respect, uh, the artistic work uh, is very close to the work of care. We can say that um, Like the, the work of care, um, the resources necessary for, uh, for, art, for the artistic work, for artistic production, are given as available, as they're present in nature, uh, always uh, available. And, and, the, and for this, they're considered like available as free. 
So uh, this is, of course, the result of uh, an extractive model that is con constituency um, that is which I'm sorry, an extractive model that it in, in its constituent identity is is at the same time colonial and patri uh, patriarchal. So it's not possible to imagine struggles in this direction not taking the two elements at the same time and. Um, and I think that this is important and a fundamental when in new struggles, when the new struggles uh, on, 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 on basic income are moving to, to integrate this element. And to close with a, a last comment towards the work of the manifesto, uh, I guess it is important to focus on uh, practices maybe practices that can be uh, given by local conditions um, or practices of, of artwork that can be reproduced in even in a smaller, uh, in a local dimension. But working towards a manifesto, a manifesto not to ignore those experiments and new practices that can nourish and move towards it. Thank you. That could be very local and specific. So thank you very much, uh, Gabriela, for the translation. Thank you, Elenia, because I think this was a great start of our conversation. I mean, beginning by highlighting the the uh, a feminist, trans-feminist point of view on UBI, I think it's very important, and it highlights also the richness and the complexity of the of the theme we are. Uh, debating and the radical implications of, of UBI. So thank you very much, Ilenia. And um, uh, we go to our second guest, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dina Beard. Dina Beard is the um, uh, executive director of the lab in San Francisco. It is a non-profit experimental art space and beyond that, or previously to that, he, she also was assistant curator at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And why is, is Dina uh, here and why it's so uh, important to have her here? Because beyond working and launching our, our manifesto, the idea is also that these occasions are occasions of mapping, what also on the institutional level is moving uh, in relation to UBI and something is happening in San Francisco, for example. So what we have read online uh, lately is that uh, starting from the first months of the new year, the city of San Francisco will implement an experimental basic income for artists where the city will select a few hundreds, probably, or I, I read 150 artists or something like that, uh, living in San Francisco providing them with an income of $1,000 for at least the first six months of the year. So, of course, we want to know your informed uh, opinion. Is this only like political propaganda? It is something that, I, that has something to do with a, with a sincere, let's say, um, um, goals of UBI. And also, let me also um, tell one last thing about you. Um, I saw that the lab, the space that you are directing, is also working with the uh, with with the uh, let's say the wage chart for a fair uh, income for art workers and artists. So I think you're absolutely not stranger to uh, a reflection on 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 uh, on art economy in general. So thank you very much, Dina. I leave the word to you. Thank you, Michael. It's a great introduction. Thank you for having me and Emmanuel and Gabriela. I really appreciate having this conversation in English, even though I realize the tyranny of English um, is just widespread. <laughs> we desperately need to move away from um, English as a as the predominant language for nuanced conversations like these. So, but thank you in this in this case for accommodating me and others. Um, the San Francisco is such an interesting space to talk about these kinds of models in because it is, of course, completely um, limited and 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 kind of uh, restrained by the United States's very, very conservative understanding of what an arts economy might look like. 
Um, but at the same time, it's really, it, it thinks of itself as a radical, like kind of predecessor of these things. So I always think of San Francisco as a Petri dish. You drop something in and it resonates completely within the entire city. So it's a great space for um, utopian projects, of course, but it's also a great place for, for corporations as has been shown in the past to test out different kind of ideas and models, especially in relationship to libertarian capitalism. Um, so we've seen this, you know, from gold mining to data mining, the entire city gets taken over by different kind of corporate operations. Um, but every once in a while, there's like a little kind of window, a loophole in which people kind of throw in a utopian experiment or two. So everybody kind of considers it this liberal city. Um, I, I'm very cynical about it, but I'm also still like to consider it a playground of sort, and especially a playground to kind of throw wrenches in the machines of capitalism. Um, so the way in which um, this UBI, the San Francisco UBI program kind of came about was a, a lot of pressure from people in the city, especially um, the lab and, and other artists organizations to try to reduce the bureaucracy of how artist funding was distributed. Um, to give you some sort of idea, uh, San Francisco's budget is about $12 billion right now and less than 0.07% of that goes to the arts. And of that 0.07%, that $90 million, more than half of that $90 million goes to administrating its arts program. So, so much money is kind of contained in the administration of that arts program. Even beyond that, beyond the administration of it, there is these, um, this use of the arts funds to create public art for the city. So it's also, you know, kind of maintaining a certain kind of image of the city itself for tourism's sake. So I, I, after doing a bunch of surveys and a bunch of studies, it was, I finally determined that less than 0.004% of that arts budget goes directly to artists. So it's really, it's always these token honorariums, these gestural amounts. Um, the problem is uh, we have experienced a loss of about 50% of our nonprofit organizations over the past 10 years due to rising rents and evictions. And of and that's not even to say we have no way of surveying or understanding how many artists and audiences have left as well. And the city has become completely homogenized and taken over by Silicon Valley campuses. And we have lot we have basically lost an entire arts community. The city used to have uh, alternative art spaces. You couldn't, you couldn't in the Mission District where the lab is held. You couldn't actually move from one city block to an, to the next without hitting an alternative art space of one kind or another in the '90s, and they have vanished entirely. We're one of three organizations left in the in the Mission who um, service kind of a, a community-minded art schema. But this this closure is acknowledged by the city for sure. And, it's acknowledged, and the homogenization of that has been acknowledged by the city. But again, the bureaucracy comes in and kind of refuses to allow the money that the city actually holds and, and um, possesses to be redistributed fairly. Um, so uh, just to give you some context, I, I've worked for a couple major museums, this, the Berkeley Art Museum, the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I've worked for artist magazines and arts magazines and um, a couple of different alternative art spaces. But the, the thing that I kept seeing is that the artists we were paying were working maybe six months to three years on a project and we we're still getting paid maybe $500 or less. And that is generally kind of the rule in the city of is is everybody kind of in nationally it's basically the token honorarium is five hundred dollars or less in spite of how much labor you put into the project in spite of how much work any kind of arts project might require of you so the insanity of seeing that happen to people i knew and loved and artists that i was working intimately with for many many years and seeing how much um their their ability to live was compromised by their desire to produce projects um, that were benefiting these bigger, larger institutions. So by producing content and actually giving the, their labor over to these institutions, these institutions are basically extracting value from them. 
and we're using them to to basically create the agenda of the museum or the agenda of the art space. Um, and and even for the arts magazines, the agenda of the magazine. So it became absolutely infuriating to watch this happen to many, many friends and see them get evicted from their apartments and have to leave the Bay Area and kind of move elsewhere to try to find, find ways of working. Um, another, another aspect of this model that's happened, I mean, I mean, I'm sure this happens in Europe somewhat, but um, most major museums rely on galleries to pay for the majority of their shows. So the the larger kind of solo shows by by American artists are usually subsidized at least forty percent by their galleries. So their galleries are usually um, kind of producing, helping produce the objects that will then sell later. So the artists will get paid eventually by the galleries, but during the immediate term, while they're producing all the work for the shows, they're not getting paid. So there's this idea that you will, you know, you just have to put everything on your credit card, you have to accrue debt, debt this immense, immense debt accrual, of course, um, which comes with its own kind of servitude and indentured servitude to um, the, the credit card companies and different debting corporations. So I was working with incredibly successful artists who were enslaved by this debt, and it was just absolutely um, inconceivable to think how we could, how it could be creating this situation, how institutions who are supposedly purportedly creating value in the lives of their audiences and the artists they serve and the people they serve were extracting so meanly and desperately value from these, from these artists. It was a futile construct. Um, so when I left the museum to take over the lab and the lab itself was $150,000 in debt when I took it over, um, I started writing these letters about UBI and I started writing these letters to the Arts Commission, which is the San Francisco entity that maintains the arts budget, but also um, to the mayor and other arts organizations about eliminating bureaucracy and figuring out ways to create direct payments to artists. Um, alongside, you know, I also thought that the that the um, arts budget itself should go for paying should go to pay rents um, for different nonprofit organizations. So basically maintaining time and space for artists through these kinds of direct payments. Um, unfortunately, what seemed to happen with this new UBI model, um, which definitely was taking into account a lot of the things that I had discussed with with the um, different orga organizations, um, that were administrators that I had been talking to is that, you know, basically it's giving $1,000 stipends to 130 artists over six months. And so that's 700, it comes out to like $780,000. Um, on top of that, $300,000, $400,000 has been allocated and set aside for the administration of those $780,000. So, and the administration will be carried out by another nonprofit. So the arts, the arts commission, which has 45 full-time staff members who receive health care and a pension, are now outsourcing the administration of the UBI program to another arts organization that is extracting another 30% of that funding to be able to administrate it within their own kind of mission-driven biases of that, org that organization. This had already been preconceived by, you know, by the um, administrators and that organization itself. So we have um, this deeply, already deeply compromised program, compromised by the fact that, you know, at this point, at least half of the income that was supposed to go to artists is already going to administration of the program itself. Um, but that it's also requiring artists to apply this really, this, this already the application process is becoming revealed to be like a, an, in, an intense labor itself. So, you know, you're talking about 30 to 50 hours of work just to complete the application. Um, and then once, once the application goes in, you're looking at only $6,000. So it's $1,000 stipends over six months. And the thing is, is <laughs> the cost of renting a spare room in somebody's house that could be the size of a closet is at minimum, I mean, pre-pandemic, it was $2,000 to rent a like, bare bones spare room in the city of San Francisco. Now it's about $1,600 accounting for the depreciation of, of rent. But the $1,000 a month won't even get you a room. It won't even get you a, a SRO, like a single 
yeah, single residency occupancy in a hotel. Like it's it's just terrible. So you are you are looking at um, it's not even it's not even barely lifting you out of poverty. It is giving you a tiny tiny boost to maybe like subsidize some art materials. Um, so it's not UBI. Um, it's not even it's not unconditional and it's not universal in any way, shape, or form. But it is a gesture, and I do I do appreciate the experiment a lot. But more than anything, if we're going to have, if we're going to talk about UBI, we're going to have to talk about bureaucracy, and we're going to have to talk about how much administration is required to, to distribute those funds and to create spaces in which we can actually reallocate that wealth fairly and completely. Um, I don't, you know, always this idea of universal. Unconditional, I can get behind and no, no matter which shape or form. Universal is also is just a, incredibly difficult to conceive um, within nations and states and borders that have so many different um, limitations on what universality means. So we are, um, when it comes to this experiment, I think it's already failed, but it's definitely a, you know, it's worthy, it's worthy of consideration and is worthy of pushback. And I hope um, the global community at least responds to San Francisco in its, in its kind, of, kind of pathetic liberal attempts to create something akin to a UBI program and says like, no, actually what we're talking about is this. Like, good try, <laughs> well attempted, but what we're trying to do is this. So um, the thing that, you know, the thing that we're trying to do at the lab and why I took over the lab is create something that's more akin to just um, create a space and give people keys to that space, the login for our website, the, the absolute um, autonomy to totally take over the institution itself. So the basically, um, I give artists $25,000 to $100,000 each, I guess three to four, three to four artists per year this money and this is definitely not universal. I'm definitely working with artists who are considering how how to remodel institutions and how to think about platforms for their work and definitely thinking in a political realm as ways ways of creating not only mutual aid for for people in the city but also creating spaces in which um, artwork can actually come to exist. So the nuances and the apolitical senses of art can actually um, drive drive our, our sensibilities in the world. Um, so this 25 to $100,000, I give to them without caveats. Um, the only thing that we do before we, we distribute the funding is create a contract, a, a kind of letter of agreement in which we decide how much, what my role will be, what the institution's role will be in distributing that funding. So they get to determine how much I will be employed by them um, so if I'm going to be creating touring contracts with them, if I'm going to be um, doing fabrication, helping them with fabrication, if I'll be promoting programs or not promoting programs, if I'm supposed to just get lost for three to four months while they take over the space, um, that's completely fine. But the idea is that it's public funding, so we have to create some sort of transparency with how that works so that I can show other people what happened um, during that time period. But those conflicts and the failures and the inevitable, like whatever, you know, whenever an artist kind of like, you know, one of one of their artists asked us to saw down the security, security gates we had over our windows in the lab, um, which, you know, kind of opens us up to, we're in a kind of difficult neighborhood. So it just opens us up to all these security concerns. But we, we did that absolutely with the understanding that, you know, this is part of the process, like um, thinking about all of these concerns. So what the lab does is definitely not a UBI model, but it's definitely attempting to think about what it's like to redistribute funds without caveats unconditionally, and also think about what artists can do with institutions, like allowing, allowing institutions to be rebuilt through that model, to be changed and systemically like impacted by that funding. So the funding is actually enables direct democracy to happen more than anything else. So I think that's all I had to say, but I really appreciate this chance to talk with you all. Thank you very much, Dina, for opening this window on the Bay Area and, you know, to, to, to basically uh, 
let us know about this. This that looks more like a marketing operation, a branding operation in the homeland of libertarian capitalism. Uh, but consider that the um, Art for UBI network is an allied in order to advocate for, uh, let's say, real forms of, of, of UBI and at least, uh, at least effective forms. Uh, so I thank you very much again. I hand over the, uh, the, uh, to Emanuele, Emma. So you yeah. can introduce the next guest. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dina. And uh, uh, in, the UBI, in the UBI manifesto, we have... Uh, a dot uh, against bureaucracy <laughs> uh, because we define the bureaucracy as sort of vampire of uh, um, the artist uh, um, energies, uh, but also, as you say, uh, uh, more concretely, of also uh, the money, uh, the public money um, management. Um, just to say that. In uh, Milano, in, the, in our uh, uh, Macau Art Center, uh, we did a pilot of uh, UBI, uh, self-managed. So uh, we collect uh, money uh, in the organization and uh, we pass through this discussion for uh, at least uh, three years, uh, how to reduce the self-bureaucracy generated. Uh, and in the end, we decided uh, that the easiest way was to create this fund and uh, allow everyone to ask for monthly based uh, a, um, a basic income. So it's a sort of uh, uh, mutual aid trust in between uh, uh, the artist community and everyone that in that month claim for the for the basic income created by the community as access uh, without any more discussion <laughs> and, and this i have to say is, is quite hard uh, but anyway uh, also generated fight in between uh, the members because after a while uh, um, maybe claiming for your basic income uh, uh, in front of the other members uh, because you want to do nothing in this moment uh, is quite no uh, a gesture of freedom but in the end uh, like foster uh, i think in long terms also um, the relational fabric of trust uh, uh, in between uh, um, uh, the the artist community um, the next uh, speakers is uh, julio linares i met uh, Julio, uh, in many uh, um, uh, occasions uh, uh, in the last years uh, in Europe, uh, uh, in these um, uh, panels uh, gathering uh, uh, networks uh, um, uh, of people that were um, experimenting with new technology and blockchain uh, alternative uh, economic space, basically. Um, and um, uh, Julio um, is um, an economic uh, anthropologist uh, serving uh, uh, this network called the uh, uh, Basic Income Earth Network. Um, he is from uh, Guatemala, but based uh, uh, in Berlin uh, in the last years. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, currently working uh, on this project uh, called Circle UBI that is uh, a universal basic income project on blockchain. Uh, his work uh, uh, explores uh, the relationship between uh, money, direct democracy, uh, technology, and uh, uh, basic income. Uh, today, uh, he uh, proposed to me uh, to speak about the uh, circle, and uh, he uh, gave also a title to this intervention that is in search of the money of the commons. Thank you, Manuele. Uh, and thank you everybody for organizing. Also, thank you, Ilenia, for the good, uh, very, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, also, the very good talk of Dena. I'm really happy to be here and to share with you all for a little bit. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so as Emmanuel was saying, I am uh, originally from Guatemala, uh, but I've been living in this uh, little peninsula of Asia 
as I call it, called Europe uh, <laughs> for the last two years. And uh, yes, I've been here working on a project called Circles UBI, which is an attempt at uh, doing economic art in a way, or economic democracy as well. So it's, uh, yes, um, I call the talk uh, In Search of the Money Commons because uh, I, 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 I like this as a way of framing uh, what it means for me to do a real a radically uh, revolutionary based income. So today money, as everybody knows, is a commodity. It's a, it's a, it's a fetish, a commodity fetishism, no? Marx called it a commodity form in this first chapter of the capital, uh, when it's uh, basically this power that humans do when they assign uh, powers to an object and then this object has powers over them, uh, turning them also into objects, no? Turning everything into commodities. So today money is like God that turns everything else into another commodity. And so uh, I came to the Circles project thinking, okay, how, how could we make other gods possible or, or other goddesses? You know, how do we use these uh, machine fetishes that are today our, our, our monies, uh, so to speak, uh, as a way of dealing away with the private property of money and bringing together, I think in Italian, you call it a moneta comune or a, a money commons, uh, which is basically uh, I would say the initial condition, if you really want to have the basis of a radically different democratic society. And so um, the Circus project uh, started, I think the idea a couple of years ago, seven, six years ago, by uh, some people inside of this crypto world. I, I call it crypto feudalism because of its political economy. It's quite feudal in its nature because of many problems that it has just as you know, technology as a whole today. Um, but uh, the idea was basically of saying, how about if everybody could issue uh, their own money and then exchange with each other uh, in, in sort of any society that they're in and exchange uh, with who the, whom they trust. Um, so that was very interesting for me because at the time I was doing research on ways of financing a basic income. So I was thinking about it from a state perspective. I was thinking about it, okay, what if we make a sovereign wealth fund? Uh, and make an investment fund that uh, makes an industry and then the dividend of this industry gets given to people as a basic income. Or let's do taxation, no? redistribute taxes from the rich and give it to the poor. Or, uh, and, and, and through this exploration, I was thinking to myself, well, okay, if there is a basic income ha happening in Switzerland, it will not change anything at the, at the planetary level. Uh, it will not change the the sort of institutionalized hierarchies of domination of, of inequalities uh, that exist at all levels of society. And so I was thinking, how, how is it possible to make not a universal basic income, but a pluriversal basic income? One that goes beyond today's nation states uh, and, and, and actually tries to uh, challenge uh, the structures that Elena was well mentioning today, such as uh, patriarchy and the capitalism. Um, and so I came to this project and, and uh, I, 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 well, I, I was, this was already a, a year and a half ago here in Berlin. At the beginning, I didn't know anything about uh, technology. I am an economic anthropologist. I you know, was slowly studying money and value and where does it come from and all these questions. And I got into this feudal world, the crypto feudal world and started understanding you know, uh, how all this magic, all this digital alchemy, uh, all these programmers and all these people comes about. And um, it was only until this year in February where we started testing the first iterations of these of this circles here in Berlin with a community of different artists, different producers, local uh, people who make, uh, I don't know, their, uh, their local drinks, their local beer, a small farmer, um, uh, people who do delivery uh, as a cooperative, for example, you know, people who were exploited by Deliveroo and Lieferand and all these projects. Um, and started to self-organize, no? So basically connecting with other cooperatives here around Berlin and, and see how we could complement each other's uh, needs with the resources that uh, the others could bring. Um, and so that was a, a very interesting process because I was thinking, okay, it's not just uh, about making a money uh, because anybody can issue their own money. The hard part is getting anybody else to accept it. And so we were thinking, okay, how do we bring this digital money on a crypto blockchain to a normal person in a shop in Berlin who only accepts cash, uh, right? 
and this was uh, this is this is still a challenge, no? Because it really tells you like sort of the global uh, hierarchies of uh, of how these things work. Like many people uh, think that uh, you know being cashless is the future and so on, but in fact it's a, it's a problem, no? Uh, we say that we are trying to provide an alternative to to the to the digital infrastructures, the digital colonial infrastructures of Visa and Mastercard and all these things. But it's really, really a challenge uh, to try to fight these monsters in practice, like to build an infrastructure that can allow for the community's production of value to flow and be accepted and exchange and, and actually build other uh, other uh, other forms of organizing life. Um, and this is mainly because this is mainly because people are already oppressed under under capitalism, uh, and they do not have a lot of time to do it. But despite of this, uh, we had a good um, a good response uh, by many people here in the community. And then uh, it was a very interesting moment that just about two months ago we did the official launch of Circle. So we stopped this testing phase and we we launched it officially to the world. And uh, one thing happened, which was that it it came to Twitter, and this is a uh, it, it was a nightmare uh, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I mean, it was very interesting what happened. Basically, people in the internet found out. People in China, in Vietnam, in, in, the, in the Taiwan, in the US, in Venezuela, in Nigeria, all over the world, people were trying to enter the system. And we are a team of five you know, hackers and activists and artists. Uh, my two hackers uh, were totally burned out. They wanted to come to the party of the launch, which was meant for the local community. And at the end, they were just crying in front of their computers, and you know, for the, for days it was uh, it was a very interesting moment because it told you how much people are so colonized by this idea of money, especially cryptocurrency, as this thing that will make you rich right away, right? So like Bitcoin, no, like oh, this scarcity money, this commodity money, like I get it, and the next day I'll become rich. And circles, the design of circles, it was designed consciously against the speculation, against uh, uh, accumulation of it in the sense that uh, there is no 21 million Bitcoin that will be minted at some point. In the circle system, everybody always issues the same amount of money. So it's from the base layer. Um, uh, people always, to, right now today, when you enter, uh, you get three people to trust you. You enter the, we call it the web of trust, and then everybody issues eight circles a day. So no matter where you are, you always get an equal amount, uh, and then you can exchange uh, for the things and the stuff that you need. And so this is a, this is an old practice. Community currencies have existed for like thousands of years. In, in Italy, you have Sardex, which is one of the, the best examples of this in the world. Uh, uh, Giuseppe Litera being a very, very good person in this field. Uh, and yes, so we are trying to incorporate a lot of these learnings into these sort of uh, digital technologies while also acknowledging uh, it's embedded contradiction, no? I mean, the whole, uh, these machines that we're using to communicate with each other are based on a system of exploitation that takes uh, minerals from Africa, takes them to China, and then sells them back to you in San Francisco and Berlin. And so acknowledging these contradictions, we're saying, okay, how do we build upon these technology systems that can allow for the distribution of values that are different from the values of capitalism, that visualize uh, things like care work and reproductive labor uh, that do not sort of divide between the private and the public sphere um, and so on. And so it's really an interesting process because uh, it's really trying to like go at it in an, in, a, in an active approach and saying, these are the contradictions. How do they play out in practice? You know? How do we try to resolve them in practice through community organizing? So every month and the first Wednesday of every month, we have an assembly in Berlin where the people join and then we organize different economic groups or economic councils as we call them. So the food group, the logistics or ecologistics as it's called here, um, you know, the supermarkets and getting people to go to them and ask them, hey, would you like to join this? Uh, how would it work and so on and so forth, right? And it's really a struggle now, even in Berlin in, this, in the center of this little empire, uh, people are shutting down the, the shops, you know, they don't have uh, money. People are, uh, you know, depressed first of all, because it's winter. For a second of all, because of Corona, they cannot have, they don't have money. They don't have ways of exchanging. And so they're telling me like, hey, I cannot uh, pay my employees for the next month. They have to go to get uh, the shitty bureaucracy money from the state. Uh, and what do we do? <laughs> and so Circus is an attempt at trying to really democratize money as a way of 
be freeing ourselves from, from the state uh, uh, architectures, institutions, uh, and also the capitalist ones. And that's, that's, a, that's a high claim, but it's really a, a, an art attempt, but also a really economic democratic attempt at taking the means of the production of money and saying, if people were to own their own money and issue it equally from below, uh, you could do what uh, in economics, they call it the modern monetary theory, like MMT, but from without the state. Uh, you can do this. There is no reason why not. Uh, the, the basis of uh, modern monetary theory is that for a, a state to issue money has to be a sovereign state. But what we're saying is no, like fuck the state, fuck the sovereign. The sovereign are the people. People can issue money just because they exist unconditionally without a debt, without a positive interest on their lives. Uh, and then exchange with each other and self-organize. And that's, that's the, what we're trying to incentivize and make here in Berlin and also tell all these other people that join. Uh, we have about now 100,000 and 100, people that managed to join the system all over the planet. And I think at least 1% of them where they understand, I think, uh, or 10% of them, they understand that uh, this, is more, this is for, not for making yourself rich, but for trying to really, um, relocalize economic relationships around you, go against this globalized uh, system of production and go back to the local circuits, which is something that uh, the corona crisis uh, has really taught uh, people these days that we need to rely on the regional bioregions and, and, and sort of, yeah, revive these local practices of production and exchange that are already there. Um, I, yeah, I call this talk in search of the money commons because it's really a, an attempt at saying, okay, how do we actually make money a commons? How, how do we take away the private property within money itself in order to not just imagine, but to really materialize other worlds uh, beyond the, this framework of the state and, and, and the capitalism and create other social forms like this democratic confederalism that the Kurdish people talk about. Uh, how do we bring about these democratic municipal assemblies that can federate from national to international levels and have a monetary system that is democratic as well. So this is the sort of uh, sort of the terms that I'm trying to think about and organize about. Of course, with uh, with you know, it's many many contradictions. Um, but I, I think I'll leave it at that, and then yeah, we can talk about later in the in the questions. Thank you, thank you very much, Julio. The last uh, the last time. Uh, uh, I was in conversation with Julio. Uh, it was together with another great anthropologist uh, uh, that was uh, David Graeber. Um, and they, yeah, we shared uh, in the last years uh, a lot of uh, uh, research uh, in this uh, hype uh, of blockchain uh, and, uh, and new technology. But in the end, uh, this crypto, this crypto, World uh, um, after during ten years, uh, in my opinion, uh, um, uh, made in evidence uh, that uh, in a way it was not able to change anything. Uh, if the the without this uh, uh, question uh, questioning, what is the value? No, uh, because because basically we saw that uh, Bitcoin. Uh, went very fast from a DIY uh, uh, alternative uh, to uh, financial market uh, and white male uh, uh, betting for a Lambo, uh, no? Um, and so basically, if there is not this anthropolo anthropological or uh, cultural uh, uh, debate uh, that is questioning uh, what is the value for us? Because what is wealth for us? For us, no. Uh, uh, probably the wealth for me is uh, is also to have joy, uh, to, uh, to 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 being able to, uh, to 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 share in a cooperative way um, uh, what I am doing, uh, to to foster these uh, um, alliances uh, and uh, social fabric. Uh, uh, in between, in between human and uh, also resources, not human uh, and uh, uh, other other actors, uh, I am happy for that. No, uh, I, why I am storing the money if I have not this value? No, 
And so on the other side, uh, there is a process, uh, what we call uh, this extractive model, uh, is a way to storage uh, an abstract value that in the end uh, has no sense, even no sense. No, uh, it, it makes us lose what is value. Uh, and so I think uh, this processing of uh, uh, defining value through commoning uh, is also a continuous definition of uh, what is wealth, what is, what is our vision, no? And that's why also the autonomy in defining uh, a monetary system uh, and economic space uh, is not so much about uh, uh, abstract money, but is more about uh, what we want, what we uh, enjoy really but not uh, uh, in a fake uh, uh, no um, uh, marketing of, uh, of 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 desire um, that's why uh, and i think this is also a bridge for the next speakers uh, because uh, in in the last uh, in the last uh, meeting uh, um, anna rispoli um, was pre presenting this project uh, based in Brussels uh, called the Common Wallet. But again, uh, uh, it, it's a wonderful project in which a community of artists are experimenting what happens if they uh, put in common their real income, personal income. Um, and, um, and in uh, the last month, I had some discussion with Anna uh, and for me, it's also interesting uh, to question now um, how, as artists, uh, we could uh, um, help uh, uh, with art intervention uh, uh, performance uh, uh, this uh, uh, survey about this cultural revolution. No, how we can uh, we can conceive uh, our work as an artist uh, or a, a theorist. Uh, um, uh, in a way in which uh, uh, this quality of the discussion uh, is more uh, shared, you know, is rooted uh, in uh, in the in the local uh, situation, in uh, in the popular housing, uh, in uh, in our daily life, you no. Know? And so uh, she was uh, explaining me, um, uh, the work uh, she is doing, uh, and uh, she is. Uh, um, um, uh, thinking to to develop in the next in the next uh, uh, year, and uh, uh, and and this this aspect uh, I think is also uh, super important uh, as an assembly of uh, thinkers, but also uh, uh, persons and artists that can produce this narrative. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the speakers. Sorry, I, I'm speaking from a phone that uh, tends to fall, but it gives a bit of dynamic to the video. And um, yeah, I'm really inspired from, from the interventions, especially because there are some keywords that uh, pops up and then uh, somehow, uh, yeah, gives, gives the bridge to other kind of, uh, of uh, embodiment of the thoughts. Uh, one of these is the bureaucracy that Dana just mentioned, how, I mean, how to face bureaucracy. And uh, I have to say that in our experience with the Common Wallet, that, uh, as uh, Emanuele said, is, uh, is a group of 10, uh, ten uh, art maker, or let's say art related people, uh, that decided to, to share only one bank account and uh, to put all the income we generate, all the income we have from all kinds of things, like uh, from public funding to, the, to uh, uh, unemployment, to, uh, to salaries, um, to the, you know, the kids, uh, the kids uh, uh, benefits, um, to put it together and then to, to to skip bureaucracy uh, because of uh, because we, we decided for a, to go for a totally anarchist uh, approach to distribution and so uh, basically we put everything we have which is very socialist and then everybody takes whatever he needs which is quite anarchist uh, without control 
So we do not uh, allocate uh, the same amount to everybody. We do not redistribute voila, uh, in, a, in a fair or unfair way, but everybody takes according his needs or her needs and um, uh, without justification. So we, don't, we start from a, from a uh, presumption of a radical trust uh, that, uh, that the, the, the reason for, for voila, uh, uh, from, from taking some money are, are necessarily good. Uh, and of course, this works only on a small scale for us. So that's why I'm really, um, I'm really interested in this pluriversal approach to basic income. I mean, how can we think uh, 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 sort of transcendent, uh, to transcend bureaucracy? Uh, if we, uh, I mean, can we still think on a global scale or do we have to think to a pluriversal uh, local scale? I mean, uh, is this then a basic income, a sort of a, a universal one general system or is it integrating uh, as a sort of a ecology of different ways? Um, I don't have the answer, but it would, I, I find this platform a very, very, um, good, good place to to keep on thinking together. The other word that maybe didn't appear, but it was there somehow, was uh, reciprocity. So uh, that is also mentioned in the manifesto that is proposed. Uh, so how um, how reciprocity works, and especially what do we mean by reciprocity? I mean, from a more anthropological, classical anthropological point of view, reciprocity is quite of a spooky word because basically you give something to someone and then you wait something back. Uh, it's a nice, uh, it's a quite, uh, I mean, a system of, uh, of gift that is, uh, that is never like a free gift. Uh, and that's something that, for instance, in the experience of the Common Wallet after three years, we, um, we learned to point out as something that is very, very much rooted in our, um, in our culture. I wouldn't say Western, I think it's much broader than a Western uh, cultural approach, this reciprocity uh, presumption. But we, we understood how uh, tricky it is, in fact, uh, the fact that uh, you um, uh, you apply a certain cost for solidarity in a way there is something that is uh, that is not universal basically you're not uh, uh, while I think it's very interesting the word universal in that sense basically we are paid for the fact of being alive for the work of uh, being a source of life um, so with with this with these words in in mind, um, I I ask myself, okay, it's a, uh, how how can we just break the bubble? How can we um, get beyond the fact of uh, having a super interesting and 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 uh, rich discussion between us? Let's say, how can we stop to convert the converted? And uh, how can we lobby to the rich ones? <laughs> um, so I took the occasion when I was offered to, to propose an opening speech for one of the main festival uh, in Austria. In fact, one of the main festival in Vienna. I cannot say the name because the program is not out. So I'm gonna keep the substance for a bit. Um, but it's a big festival and uh, they, they have a new interesting format, which is uh, proposing an artist to write a speech for the opening uh, day. And I thought, okay, the opening speech of the festival would be uh, would not be one person saying something that can be a genial uh, and amazing, brilliant speech, but it would be a multitude of uh, of people uh, talking about UBI. Uh, and I see this as a project that could, in a way, bridge uh, a theoretical and um, po political economy uh, theory and uh, speculation into um, a more propaganda <laughs> approach to art uh, that, um, I, that is not at all a shame of uh, uh, popularizing concepts. And of course, I mean, I, I also <laughs> come from a feminist background. So for me, 
popularizing means really embodying uh, things, embodying thoughts, embody uh, intelligence. Um, so what is happening is that uh, I'm I'm starting a research right now in collaboration with uh, with uh, local activists and local artists um, to find as many people as possible that want to collaborate in this uh, sort of uh, multiple uh, uh, speech in a, in a multiple voice uh, speech um, that would answer to a couple of very simple questions that uh, are basically relating to uh, how your life would change if you wouldn't have to mind about your own and your family survival, uh, economic survival, because we are not yet talking about uh, the ecological collapse that is going to come very soon. Um, we just work on the few years before. Um, and with this uh, simple question, uh, we just uh, initiate conversation that, of course, talk about uh, cultural revolution and talk about a systemic uh, revolution, because, of course, um, the, the most radical approach of uh, UBI implies um, a redefinition of what is uh, um, how capitalism is is. Uh, is functioning in the sense that, uh, uh, for me, one of the one of the big um, mm, okay, there are a couple of uh, aporias, let's say, in the in the in the proposition. One of it is uh, if we do not rethink uh, the system of uh, uh, in which UBI is uh, is uh, inscribing itself, um, we cannot uh, prevent the fact that uh, all the price would grow i mean the price of bread the price of uh, the 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 housing price everything would grow and then uh voila the, but we will have another moment probably to talk more on a technical thing for now what i can say is that um, what is really exciting is first of all um the fact that uh, there is a possibility of uh, infiltration. It's always an exciting um, perspective, in a way, how to give voice uh, to um, to uh, irredent and uh, and um, um, naughty, let's say, um, uh, proposition and and how to confront uh, what is uh, the what 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 is outside the bubble and what is outside our own bubble um, how would uh, the millionaire in vienna would react to this proposition how would the conservative would react to this proposition and how would the social democratic uh, establishment would react to this proposition um, the project is linked to a media campaign because voila, a festival is a, is a big festival, so we, we probably will manage to uh, have the text uh, published on, uh, on national newspapers as, many, as much as uh, uh, the free newspaper that the uh, homeless uh, association are distributing for free in the city, so uh, how to bridge uh, different levels. And voila, for me, it would be really a great chance if, uh, voila, if this platform uh, would like to collaborate, in a sense, to be a sort of a sparring partner, um, uh, thinking together about uh, uh, getting out of the comfort zone, our comfort zone and the comfort zone of the established art institution that is uh, uh, in this case, that is taking a risk. Well, I keep it short because I have the feeling that we are already a bit um, uh, quite late. And so it would be great to keep a bit of time for questions. So thank you very much, Anna. And thank you very much for the invitation to collaborate and to, to the occasion that you are providing to uh, art for You be manifesto with this uh, Vienna plan that really sounds sounds not only exciting but also important you know like an important occasion so thank you very much and this is i think a very a very interesting way through which we can continue to work together not only as 
you know, writes in a collective manifesto and advocating for UBI, but also testing ourselves really uh, uh, on the ground of, of cultural production, cultural industries, the art system. So I think it's it's a great opportunity that you're offering all of us here. And uh, let's let's then pass to our uh, next and last guest before we open uh, to questions. And um, so the next guest is Gabriella Riccio. Gabriella Riccio is first of all, as Emanuele and I, uh, part of the, uh, of the Institute of Radical Imagination. She is a researcher, she's an artist, She's a cultural organizer. She is based in Madrid and Naples. And in Naples, she is part of the Asilo. Asilo is a self-managed space that uh, it's very linked to cultural production, to the arts, but deals with basically practicing culture and arts as commons. So uh, please, Gabriella, it's your turn. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Actually, I was participating to the discussion, and together here with me, uh, there is Giuseppe Michelli, um, which I <laughs> reciprocally introduced as researcher and a member of Lazilo. And um, after the pandemic, well, during the pandemic. Um, we, as Lazila, we were involved um, in a European project on commons. Uh, well, actually, we brought into the project uh, the perspective of the commons. And at that time, we were asked to propose um, something that could be useful uh, for art uh, and, and cultural workers uh, in the new scenario that that was evident. And the one evident thing uh, that was happening in Italy, but it was the same destiny uh, in many other countries, is that uh, art workers and cultural workers were, well, that not only we saw that, that art was considered a non-essential activity. So uh, it was, not in the priority. And that um, cultural workers and art workers were among the most affected because as Elenia was stressing before, um, in Italy we have a situation where uh, rights are not recognized, work rights are not recognized. Most of the art workers, like actually the art workers that succeed in a way represent the very minority of the panorama, but the entire art world is made of a large number of individuals who are most of the time working in a non-acknowledged uh, uh, situation, like really um, not even under contract. We're not only speaking of intermittence, but uh, really in a very precarious way. Um, so what we witnessed is that the bureaucracy, once again, when the state was, was presenting solutions with some art bonuses for, for artists, actually the large majority couldn't be reached by those measures because they were not in the bureaucratic system. They were not acknowledged by the institution who normally manage assistance. Um, so they were absolutely uh, precarious. They were losing their, not only their capacity to survive, but also to pay for their houses. They were absolutely precarious. So um, Lazilo started amplifying and connecting all the many tables that opened in all over Italy of, of groups of of art workers uh, um, asking to the institution to be seen, to be recognized, to acknowledge their situation. Um, and they, uh, they really were, were a large number of tables in all the regions. Um, so we tried to elaborate 
on this idea. And, and of course, the idea is that um, we needed measures to reach those, those workers. And one possibility that I will then call Giuseppe into to articulate better was that to claim for an income of care and creativity. Uh, we know that universal basic income is um, a concept under which many tools then need to be articulated and, and declined in their specificity. And the idea of an income of that, that can acknowledge creativity and care as a fundamental function of our social fabric, of our healthy uh, societies, uh, could be one of the um, tools that we have available here. So, uh, Giuseppe, please come into the discussion. Hi. Hi to everyone. I was not prepared to say something about this, but I thank you, Gabriella, very much to introduce this, this uh, reflection. And I will shortly only introduce this idea because maybe we have to create another um, moment of discussion, a wider one. Uh, and I also make a, a couple of questions uh, just maybe to start the debate after. So the starting point is that UBI is uh, crucial and is fundamental, but exactly as uh, uh, Dina have ever said, uh, is different because we claim something universal, but there are not universal institutions. Um, uh, and so this means that uh, in uh, the real system, UBI uh, will be always uh, uh, changed in a different uh, a sort kind of right of uh, of. Uh, of uh, administrative tools, bureaucratic tools, and that's what we have to face. So for this reason, another question is how we can imagine that also after we have some kind of money, we can claim to do our work. A lot of time our work as cultural workers is invisible. What I've said, Gabriella, is exactly one of the most important and relevant point. Uh, this is the connection with the feminist struggles, as Elenia said. A lot of time, not only artists, but all cognitive workers, I am a precarious of, you know, of a, academy, uh, are uh, totally uh, disappeared during their researches, their work, their investment uh, of uh, study, of creativity. All of that is totally disappeared. So what we have to gain uh, is to use UBI as a powerful instrument that start ourselves to make other and many other uh, claim around income. Because this is the first, UBI is the probably the most important because it's the first income that all workers all over the world in different countries can claim. And this connect in different, in different claim and different struggles. But this is not enough. Because, uh, for example, uh, the problem of in invisibility in my work is the invisibility, all right, you have not a contract, you are not a full professor, uh, 10 years of precarity in academy, so I invisibilize your work. Also, if I perceive UBI, I will not be recognized in the academic system as a cognitive worker. And this is exactly the problem that capital, cap Capitalist system um, uh, try to hide also our uh, uh, competence, and uh, this is a, a big issue. We can we can speak more about after. I don't want to take a lot of time. I just finish by saying what we uh, imagine in Asilo, as Gabriella introduced. So we imagine something that is in addition to UBI, but is a little bit different, and is the idea to subvert uh, what Dina. Uh, explain it to us. So something that can be an opportunity, but if it's institutional directed, is something uh, more different, difficult to apply with, to face with. So we imagine exactly that uh, all um, 
cognitive worker, not only artist, can uh, claim not only money, but can claim uh, money for make their own project during one year that is recognized as an artistic and cultural project. And the other element is that we're speaking about uh, income of uh, care also because there is another problem. Also, if they give us money, the problem is that, and also if the money are uh, uh, on the vital wage, the point is that um, we will use this money to live, but to subvert exactly as uh, Emma and Marco said, the blackmail of laboristic welfare and work, we need more money. If I have a, a research project or Gabriela have a, uh, another kind of artistic project, we need to a space. And Dina was precisely saying us how it costs to work in a, in a space in San Francisco, but this is the same everywhere. So we need money for an artistic project and we need also money for host institutions that are formal and informal institutions that are totally erased exactly in the pandemic. Because what they are going to close are not the only, and they don't start from big museum and big theater. They have always some kind of um, uh, financing. The problem is that what they are going to close is all the little theaters, all the cultural spaces, independent spaces. And so we have to connect the idea that, and I finish, um, we have the possibility every two, three years to say, stop a moment to the system, starting from UBI, I take my UBI, but I also apply to a special fund. And in this moment in Europe with the recovery fund, we are speaking exactly about that. And this kind of fund will not be organized from the cultural institution, traditional one. Because we, if we leave this money to the traditional institution, they will use exactly this money to uh, uh, do the same kind of uh, clientelism. I don't know how to say, uh, but the, the same kind of artistic mainstream direction where we uh, that, that we know and that we, we we struggle against. So we have imagined that there will be a big part of, of this found when we are speaking about cognitive worker that that uh, uh, should be um, given directly to workers that apply ourselves for an artistic project that may be have or not also a, a, a social impact or whatever else without some kind of output that is preconized. And we have to imagine also that this kind of income is doubled and is given also to little and informal institution that we need because if we don't do this kind of alliance also to visibilize our different kind of work as cognitive worker, we probably will stay in, a, in a, some kind of use where all the money that they are giving in, in this moment to us will not emancipate ourselves, but not in a laboristic way. They don't emancipate because there will be the money only for living. So we have to imagine different kind. Also, we can translate these also to other kind of work, also to fabric and industrial work. If we imagine that this kind of, of additional uh, income may help self-organize uh, association and, and corporation. Uh, so we can imagine a lot, starting exactly from, U, from UBI, but going also over. Uh, sorry for... Thank you. Thank you very much to Gabriel and Giuseppe. And I think another positive thing that we probably didn't calculate in the beginning, but it is, that is happening um, during this process of writing and discussing about this art for UBI manifesto is that many uh, specific solutions are coming up that maybe are not exactly universal basic income, but that are in the spirit of a universal basic income. Uh, only tonight I listed four, like the creativity and care income that we just discussed, the, the lab method to work with artist uh, circles and the common wallet. So I think like another important thing is to, uh, is, is, 
been a catalyzers for this type of experiences that once you figure them all together, they are an impressive, an impressive set of practices, I would say. So it, it is a bit late, but it's now time to, um, to open up the debate. I just ask um, the, the, the people to be, to be as concise as possible with interventions and questions. So uh, if there are questions, I'll leave it to, the, to it. Yeah, I have just one very little question, two short, really, um, slash questions to Dina. Uh, if I understand well, uh, the idea of this basic income in San Francisco, the experiment goes before the pandemic. Like the idea of the project was already there. And is this really referring to 150 artists? Like, are we speaking of 150 artists in the entire city of San Francisco? This is the question. No, I think the, the project has been in the works for about three years, as far as I know. Um, it's been a campaign on many, many different fronts to try to get something. Of course, it was completely butchered along the way. But the uh, yes, it's only for 130 artists. So, but of course, there are probably, I mean, I, I can't even count how many artists there are in San Francisco, but there, we have one of the largest artist labor forces in the country. So there, it's just absolutely impossible that 130 must be like an, less than a fifth of a, 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 like a 5% of what, of what that represents. And, it, and of course the definition of artist is so insanely hard to pin down. Do you call a graphic designer? Do you call you know, a janitor who has an art practice on the side, do you, you know, what is, what is that definition and how do we, who, who are we to say, who are we to define that? I mean, that's a really big question. Can I, can I ask a question following that? Is that all right? Yeah. A kind of riffing from that, um, I've been following circles for a long time, for, for a little while, Julio, and I'm just very curious about, um, this idea of renegotiating value with this this kind of these online communities and trying to figure out what um, what it would mean to create a UBI that was not only based on in in the kind of virtual realm but also regionally very located. So the the Sardex, of course, is 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 so located in Sardinia. Like the idea of of being able to go to your local baker in Berlin and trading circles money for flour or for, for and they and they go to their their flour distributor and exchange circles money for you know that that is really tremendously appealing creating that linkage but it's it's interesting to me that um it's a it's a global model so circles open globally which is part of the whole like um it seemed like the the confusion between you know what it was and 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 how it actually operated, but I like this idea of renegotiating value both on a regional scale, but also having a larger conversation with it. Um, can you can you address how how that's been working out? I know this is just an experiment. Yes, um, this is a, an open experiment, so it's not there is no randomized controlled trials. There is no uh, you know none of these colonial methods. It's just an open experiment and there are of course because of that unintended consequences no so we intended to do something locally that became then global or, or or local which is a really awful term that anthropologists use to talk about the local and the global together uh yeah so that was a bit awkward and just like money is awkward that was also very strange because suddenly you get this flood of people asking to be trusted online and people are like hey no i don't know you why would i trust you who are you like you know and so that was very interesting because it, it became somehow uh, exclusionary, right? Like people wanting to join and then they couldn't join. We had landlords in Cadiz in Spain saying, I want to give, I want to accept circles for rent. So my uh, uh, rent, like people that rent my, my, my house or my place can also accept it in their businesses, you know? But when we also had like the typical person was like, oh, how can I put this into an exchange? Right, so that's that's really where the value struggle is happening, where the politics is happening, uh, where people are saying, okay, what do I want to use this money for? Because it's just it's just a tool, right? The the the, the, the ethics, the the politics that you embed it with, that's what matters, and that's really what we're trying to build up here in Berlin is a culture, 
right? Of, of, of saying like, it's really a circle. Like it's not just, okay, great. Everybody wants to get, to get their veggies from the solidarity lefty farmer, but it's also a question of what is the farmer going to use it for, right? So then they can also like make a, make a circle around and really regionalize that economy. So it's really a, a, a matter of contestation. It's a political struggle. Uh, just like money is a political struggle. And what we're trying to say is, okay, how do we inbuild like this sort of practice of direct democracy of self-organization as a way of doing that, right? And that's that's really where the challenge is. And so also a part of part of the, the strategy is also to, to go to already local majors, like crazy lefty majors that want to try this out um, and say, okay, like, because if the, if the local, so to say, sovereign already accepts it, uh, then it's easier for the people to say, okay, this is money, great, right? Otherwise, the, the political struggle is, is, uh, is, hi- is harder, right? Because you really need to prove that this is money. Um, we're in a, you know, the moment is, is, is ripe for it. We're living in the, in the worst economic crisis since the 1930s, but it's also a bit of a hack of how do you organize the, an alternative economy. Uh, this has been done in economic crisis. People use complementary currencies, right? Like Saturday emerged 10 years ago and the via and so on and so forth. But now with the Corona, how do you also bring this, not just care, but healthcare into this? How do you make sure that when you do this, the people that will not, you know, uh, suffer or get infected and so on. So that's, it's a really delicate matter, you know, because I'm, I'm for, yeah, let's, you know, exchange and so on, but it's also, you can't do that right now. We're in a lockdown in Germany. So it's a bit of a, I don't know if anybody has good ideas on that. I will really appreciate it. <laughs> Are there other questions or I'm asking if the speakers want to add something to, we still have 10 minutes. So if the speakers want to add something to their previous uh, uh, intervention, that's absolutely fine. I don't know if Elenia, you want to add something or uh... no, giusto, ma penso che sarà un, um, un lavoro da fare anche nei prossimi tempi e che già è emerso poi negli interventi successivi di Julio, di Dina, di Anna, davvero di provare a fare um, questa, um, questo focus sulle pratiche che stanno emergendo. Eh, perché mi sembra interessante appunto ragionare da un lato di reddito incondizionato, reddito universale e dall'altro avere delle scale, eh, dei prototipi più piccoli, geografici, specifici che però possano davvero essere un po' contaminarsi magari tentare un po' come l'esperimento appunto di Anna che quello che conosco meglio no? ma su cui possiamo tentare anche scale diverse sperimentazioni diverse ed è anche un modo uh, per um, forse rendere più concreta questa idea di reddito universale sono d'accordo con Anna dobbiamo renderlo più popolare o più erotico ecco diciamo in chiave femminista mm-hmm. però davvero su questo tutto il, insomma oggi già moltissimi spunti e poi lavoro da fare Grazie tante anche dei, dei molti spunti arrivati. Yeah, so um, Elenia was um, highlighting that the work to be done in the next steps of our meetings will be that to focus on, on the practices that are emerging. Like already today, there were many uh, examples of different practices. So the idea is to decline uh the the claim for ubi also looking at different scales uh different geographical situated practices uh and to understand how can we can contaminate uh and hybridize this concept and um yes to conceive ubi in a more erotic way under a feminist perspective So I just renew my invitation to uh, uh, collaborate uh, to the <laughs> to the thing. I think it's really, <clears throat> I think for for what what was said at the beginning is that we really come from different uh, 
realities. Uh, I'm based in Belgium where there is a, this uh, uh, statut d'artiste, so it's a sort of artist status that uh, is a very special form of unemployment that is a uh, um, uh, similar to the model of d'intermittence in France. Uh, but what we all feel is that uh, is by this uh, mutual pollination and this uh, making network again, uh, the fact that we can uh, learn uh, a lot and, um, and break a bit the, the silence about this. I have the feeling that is, uh, it's a momentum that we shouldn't miss somehow. Uh, the, the, I have the feeling that even in uh, unsuspected fields, I mean, Davos, the, the, the World Economic Forum <laughs> is, uh, is publishing on his uh, um, voilà, uh, books of intention for the, the, the forum that is, should have happened in Switzerland this year, but it will happen in Singapore because of Corona. Um, a sort of uh, uh, indication of uh, the is, is kind of quoting UBI. So we should also be able to 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 take back the voice on where it should stand, and just to take care that is not um, that is not uh, exploited, that is not uh, um, manipulated. Also, from uh, point of view and from um, political agendas that are not probably as democratic as we want. So thank you anyway for organizing this. This is, a, I find it really as a good beginning. May I? That's all the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just very, very quickly, I, I just like to end with this idea that, you know, when the Corona crisis started, it opened an intergalactic gate uh, that we must seize the moment of. Um, you know, the idea of the economy is oikos meant originally a household in ancient Greece. And right now with the Corona crisis, we really see that we live in a planetary oikos, in a planetary household. And we must learn how to, how to live together in this way. We are all suffering from the same things right now in similar ways, of course, uh, you know, under our own local conditions. But uh, this is a moment to really reimagine and rethink the economy itself uh, by also rethinking money and rethinking like how we relate to one another. Money is just a set of promises uh, that we give to one another. So uh, how do we stop uh, believing in the promises of the state and believe more in the promises of the commons? Otherwise, we will not change the course of the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think um, I just want to to keep in my mind three ideas. One is that no matter how public institutions, cultural institutions, but the system is always an ex extractivistic mechanism. It's it's a it's it's a really extracting knowledge, life, care is the mechanism of death that is throwing the care for life, life forms onto others. Um, and another thing is that the more historically, like it, it's absurd to see that we are still considering work and the work world in the Fordist way. Like we are not there, the world is somewhere else and somehow nobody, nobody realizes it. It's, it's like we have the big elephant in the room and nobody sees it. So I think that this manifesto is really addressing this on, on a larger scale. Like it is important to acknowledge that in our system, the work is no more the, the salary work with the eight hours and stop. It goes, the, the, the boundaries between our lives and our works are totally blurred. And we pay for that with, with a disponibility, seven hours over seven and 24 hours a day. And every time artists have claimed for resources, this somehow in the last 20 years has always turned into putting more resources to the institutions that have to manage the resources. And so in an inflation mechanism, the resources for the artists aren't there anymore, exactly like Dana was addressing in, in what's going on. In, in New York. So um, really we, we should propose ways to experiment, not only experiment, but really to 
to give a different value to, as, as Julio said, to make money a common. Okay. Uh, is there any other intervention? Because it's 8.29, and so we could be really on time. Uh, yeah, just to give some conclusion to, to this meeting. Uh, um, so, being very practical, uh, we have, uh, uh, in terms of uh, agenda, uh, we have uh, the publication of uh, the Art for UBI manifesto in the next weeks. Um, I think uh, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a good idea that right up uh, from the meeting uh, to open uh, a public session, uh, maybe on the uh, Institute of Radical Imagination uh, website uh, uh, mapping all the projects uh, uh, that passed through this discussion and the previous discussions. And so for sure, uh, we have um, Circle, uh, uh, the uh, uh, unconditioned uh, um, income for artists uh, uh, for creative uh, and care uh, proposed by uh, um, Gabriella and um, and Giuseppe, um, we have um, uh, our experience in Milano with uh, Common Coin. We have a Common in Brussels. Uh, we have uh, this um, um, uh, situation, let's say, in San Francisco uh, uh, that uh, is processing uh, an institutional uh, um, uh, basic income provided by the city, but with uh, uh, some criticism and this uh, uh, discussion uh, um, um, that uh, Dina was uh, uh, taking to us uh, about uh, uh, how to give up uh, uh, or to uh, go beyond the bureaucracy and have uh, experimentation uh, uh, in uh, um, <clears throat> giving to the artist uh, uh, the web to produce uh, uh, on a, a, a institutional level uh, and 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 we could even keep it open in the process you know uh, having this mapping uh, of uh, uh, very very practical uh, 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 positioning uh, uh, and experimentation on uh, uh, the sharing of the wealth uh, and uh, basic income uh, around the world is uh, i think a super uh, um, good point and so, practically, we could basically very easily uh, open uh, uh, a map on, uh, uh, on our website uh, and start to have uh, um, uh, this, um, this overview. Third, I think that um, this gathering, we don't consider you as uh, uh, speakers uh, in this in this in this room i mean i think uh, uh, we all appreciated the uh, the spirit of uh, anna uh, uh, proposing an action no um, and i think uh, uh, that this this spirit uh, is uh, super super important uh, because we are a sort of uh, uh, speakers, think tanks, uh, discussing uh, uh, rooted in experience and so on. But it's super, it's super available to have action together, to to develop strategies, uh, and uh, and uh, and um, and also to share some productions. Um, and so, in terms of this agenda, uh, I already did an invitation. Uh, for Art for UBI manifesto in this uh, 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 the life uh, on the planet or Simanirana that is an exhibition uh, I am curating with George Seymour in uh, uh, the Art Museum of Hamburg in Germany next year and uh, I was supposed to uh, have an event uh, uh, about UBI with this uh, uh, group uh, in April 
Uh, and then I think in June, uh, Anna is uh, in Vienna. Yeah, it will be the 15th of May. Ah, in May. In May. Uh, so it's, I think it's, it's good to have uh, this uh, um, agenda going public uh, in uh, different kinds of institutions. Uh, taking this, um, this, um, this, this debate, but also maybe uh, producing some, uh, some, some uh, more articulated vision. Um, I don't know if I am missing something. Ah, yes. I think uh, today we also invented uh, a concept. Uh, because we, we say that um, uh, we, we created this, uh, this acronym of uh, unconditioned and, uh, and multiversal uh, basic income instead of universal. Um, and it's a sort of a cosmological revolution. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it's, all, it's also super available. Uh, I, I'm not joking. Um, it's, it's a nice concept. Um, and for me, that's all. Uh, I don't know if uh, you want to add something, but uh, I think it's, it's good. I have to say bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. To you. Thank oh. you very much. Bye. Bye. We'll be in touch. Let's keep in touch. Yeah. Yes. MBI. <laughs> Bye bye, thank you. MBI. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to everyone. Ciao. Ciao, 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 grazie. Ciao, ciao grazie.